The Emperor's Spears. For over a thousand years, the Emperor's Spears have watched over the embattled stars of the Ilaria's Vale Nebula. They are the barbarian sons of the haunted storm world Nemeton, tattooed headhunters standing defiant against the poisonous darkness bleeding out from the Great Rift. Calling upon the most ancient of oaths, the Emperor's Spears gather their surviving allies to ensure the light of humanity keeps burning in their besieged region of the Imperium Nihilus. The first confirmed sighting of the Emperor's Spears in Imperial space is a footnote in Eres Sikia's Historica Auguria. It notes that in the middle years of M40, the warship Daughter of the Storm answered the astropathic cries for aid sent by a deep void Adeptus Mechanicus hydroponics installation. Witness reports recovered from the installation's corrupted archives list the chapter's deployment as needlessly aggressive and heedless of collateral damage. For this, it can be extrapolated that the Xenoflora research of dubious morality did not survive the Space Marines' deployment. A final note in the archive lists the Karulian-clad brutes as lingering after the devastation in order to draw blades through the necks of fallen Xenos, and harvest the dead aliens' heads. This first recorded account roughly matches references to the Emperor's Spear's supposed origins in the 25th founding, also known as the Bastion founding. As is standard with the Imperial dating system, the exact date of the Bastion founding is a source of conflicting data, but temporal signifiers mark it within the latter 500 years of the 40th millennium. This would make the Emperor's Spears well over a thousand years old. Sentinels of the Veil The Ilaria's Veil subsector was once watched over by the most noble Celestial Lions chapter. Centuries passed, with the Lions struggling valiantly to defend such a vast realm alone, eventually resulting in a petition sent to Terra demanding reinforcement. The High Lords of Terra looked towards the blighted, burning worlds of Ilaria's Veil and at last dictated a solution. The next Space Marine founding would not see the Lions joined by one bloodline of new brothers, but two. And so the Adeptus Velari, the Sentinels of the Vale, were formed. Three chapters bound by sacred oaths, fated to watch over Elaria's Vale. Nemeton was the world chosen for the Emperor's Spears, while Camon Sen was chosen as homeworld of the Androctonus Astra chapter, the Star Scorpions in Vulgar Argot. Uh, the Andronicus Astra, and despite a proud existence, were fatally undone by flaws in their gene seed and eventually lost to the war. Their heraldry and their position as Chapter 888th in honour rolls of the Adeptus Astartes was later granted to the Mentor Legion, a gift that did not sit well with the remaining Adeptus Velari. Three chapters were enough to temporarily scour the region clean, but the Imperium is vast and subject to myriad threats. The loss of the Star Scorpions gravely wounded the Adeptus Velari, and the situation grew even more dire when the Celestial Lions began to hemorrhage warriors and ships due to inquisitorial accusations of malignancy. A region of space that had started to stretch three chapters thin was now held by only one. Keeping to their ancient oath, the Empress Spear swore they would hold the line against the darkness while the Celestial Lions reforged their butchered chapter. The lion's own nobility has slowed this process significantly, for rather than retreat entirely and rebuild, they still send forth strike forces to fight at the Empress Spear's side, refusing to completely abandon their younger brethren. Nemeton, the Storm World. Nemeton is orbited by a disk of moonlits, lesser rocks and dust from ancient planetary impacts, granting the planet a great ring akin to Saturn in the Sol system. Since the opening of the Great Rift, many of these void boulders have been weaponized as torpedo silos, fighter hangars, laser batteries or jamming stations, in preparation for what the Emperor's Spears regard as an inevitable invasion. Due to its isolation, Nemeton's defences have been layered and enhanced, even beyond that which would be expected of a space marine homeworld. A vast minefield permeates the Nemeton system, requiring inbound ships to possess up-to-date drift charts in order to navigate the system safely. The jewel in Nemeton's crown is the forge moon of Bellona, 
colonised millennia ago by a fleet from the forge world in Caledion, these tech lords chose to settle on Bologna due to its abundant mineral riches. The Emperor's Spears have capitalised on this advantage. The chapter's druidic tech marines, unable to reach sacred Mars, are trained on Bologna, and most of the Emperor's Spears warships also carry Scutari support legions aboard. All three chapters of the Adeptus Velari once cherished the easy supply route and access to material offered by Unity with Bologna, but the Empress Spears focused most of all on expanding their chapter's fleet over the course of the first millennia of their existence. With Bologna's industrious alliance, the Emperor's Spears are capable of deploying a chapter fleet far beyond the usual capabilities of most Adeptus Astartes fraternities. The storm-blighted planet of Nemeton was brought to compliance by the proud Ultramarines Legion, who brought the gift of civilization to its barbaric people. Rather than accept this gift with gladdened hearts, as the centuries passed, the clans of Nemeton abandoned the marble cities constructed by their conquerors and returned to the wilderness. Now, millennia later, the surface of Nemeton is dotted with empty, ruined cities, considered haunted by the tribes, their beautiful marble work eroded by time and the planet's endless storms. Classified as an ocean world, Nemeton nevertheless possesses thousands of archipelago chains, serving as landmasses for the population. Equatorial island chains see the longest breaks in storm cover, suffering severe seasonal monsoons instead of the eternal grey storms of more northern and southern regions. This tends to make the equatorial island clans darker in skin, with white tattoos, while the northern and southern islanders are usually paler, tattooing themselves with ink of black, red or blue. The population of Nemeton is divided into widespread clans, each with its own variant cultures and beliefs. The planet is locked in a stage of development reminiscent of the Terran Iron Era, knowing little of the wider Imperium. Wars between the tribes are common, usually over what little land exists for the taking. As a result, healers and seers are greatly respected, as are tribal elders, for their wisdom and the simple fact they have survived to old age in a culture where war strikes down a great many adults before they can reach such a venerated state. The tribe's people are enthralled to potent superstitions, such as spitting on the ground to ward away misfortune, or the need for a warrior to die with a blade in their hand to avoid shame in the eyes of the god emperor. One of the most notable religious beliefs is the notion that Nemeton's reign is the godlike expression of the emperor's sorrow, weeping for his lost bride, Alara, the historical Elara is noted in conflicting archives as either an arch-commander or the imperial saint who led the wars to first bring the region to compliance. To the people of Nemeton, she is the god-emperor's bride, and her crimson funeral veil became the nebula that bathes the stars red. The most esoteric belief held by the natives of Nemeton is that of the gas. In childhood, every son and daughter of the clans is brought before a tribal shaman, who reads the flow of fate in their blood. The nature of gases vary widely, though all are semi-supernatural promises of a specific moment or choice in the child's life ahead. The chapter believes that Nemeton's seers read these futures through the warp's echoes, like any prophecy, and armed with this poetic foreknowledge. The bearer of the gas can hopefully avoid the wrong choice when the time comes. Many gases take the form of warnings against dishonour or death should the bearer ever act in a certain way. A famous example among the chapter is that of Ivrez of the Novantai tribe, lord of the sixth war host, who was told as a child, you will die on the day you follow a raven in flight. He spent the years of his youth making sure he never walked beneath a circling raven or journeying in the same direction one of the birds flew. Years later, when serving alongside the Raven Guard warship Second Shadow, Ivras knew that to support his fellow chapter's battle to break through an enemy blockade would violate his gas, but that he would survive to fight another day if he held back. Nonetheless, he commanded his vessel, the Sky Reaver, to join the fight alongside the Raven Guard. History records that the Sky Reaver was grievously wounded and Ivras himself was killed in the ensuing battle. But the Emperor's spears were hailed in the Raven Guard's archives for their loyalty, and Yvras's name was etched into the rolls of honour among both chapters for his sacrifice. 
Veterans of that campaign were permitted to inscribe the Raven Guard's sigil upon their van braces to mark their commander's valour. The War Hosts The Emperor's Spears maintain an organisation in loose adherence to the Codex Astartes, with several notable exceptions. The first is that rather than chapter companies, the Emperor's Spears favour autonomous war hosts that can operate far from Nemeton under their own recognizance, returning only for recruit harvesting and repairs at Bologna's orbital dockyards. The exact number of these war hosts is undetermined by Imperial scholars, though it stands to reason that they are similar in number and offensive capabilities to standard battle companies. Uh, the chapter makes use of several unorthodox sigils and personalised heraldry, most of which relates to their role in the Sentinels of the Vale or their ties to Nemeton. Runes of Ogham, the written language of Nemeton that is impenetrable to most outsiders, are common across their azure ceramite. Warriors also occasionally wear cloaks of beast or serpent hide, marking their success in hunts on their homeworld. Some veteran warriors also wear the symbols of the celestial lions or the fallen star scorpions on their war plate, honouring the chapters they fought alongside for so long. One knee pad is almost always marked a deeper blue in order to provide a space for personal heraldry, which is usually given over to a specific campaign marking or to the renowned Manticora Bestia Fidelitas. The Manticora Bestia Fidelitas is the primary symbol of the Adeptus Velari, symbolising their unbreakable unity. The manticore stands for both the Celestial Lions and the Star Scorpions, gripping a trident in its talons to represent the Emperor's spears. Any warrior may wear this sacred coat of arms, so long as he has shed blood in battle. It is also commonly seen on Bolonian forces, as well as regiments of Imperial Guard stationed or trapped in Elaria's Vale over the last century. Imperial tacticians have chronicled the Emperor's Spears as exemplars of a close assault ideal. Via drop pod and gunship, the Emperor's Spears descend into the heart of the enemy and hold position long enough for other Imperial forces to advance, linking up with their vanguard. It is known that the Emperor's Spears are not the berserkers one might expect of tattooed savages, but they instead wage war in bursts of adrenal fury tempered by periods of chanted tribal dirges. Their way of waging war is chimeric, as conflictingly melancholy and joyous as the barbarians of Nemeton themselves. Imperial commanders have, in the past, accused the Emperor's Spears of being unreliable, noting that the chapter expresses space marine autonomy to a difficult degree. While the chapter has always made efforts to minimise collateral damage, its strike forces have also been known to plunge into battle. They put glory above prudence, as if the chapter's youth means its warriors are something to prove to its older brethren. Desperation in recent decades has forced the Emperor's Spears into a more cooperative mindset. Necessity has forced their hand, with Ilaria's veil in such danger. Pride can no longer come first. Now, survival must do so instead. The Druidic Council the clean delineations of librarian, apothecary, chaplain and tech marine do not exist in the Emperor's Spears. The psychically gifted battle brothers go to war in black armour, as do the machine-versed warriors that train on Bologna, along with the battle-chanting warrior priests whose duty is to stand watch over the souls of their men. All are druids, black of ceramite, white of helm. And all three orders are also trained in the alchemical and biological expertise necessary to use an apothecary's tools and harvest the gene seed of his fallen brethren. It is unclear if this break with tradition developed in reaction to the chapter's isolation or was in place beforehand. Ghosts of Nemeton The clans of Nemeton have a strained relationship with the Space Marine chapter that watches over them. To the barbarians, service in the God Emperor's armies is no honour to be fought for. It is a death sentence. Those who ascend to the shrouded heavens must abandon their natural lives in order to live as inhuman angels. Space Marines on Nemeton are not seen as warriors from the clans returned to honour their bloodlines, but as spirits of children lost to the whims of fate, reshaped past their humanity. They are not heroes to be celebrated, but ghosts to be mourned. 
the Great Rift. The Cicitrix Maledictum that ripped across the galaxy in the wake of the Despoiler's 13th Black Crusade has made travel within the Imperium Nihilus a nightmare of tempestuous voyages, catastrophic war breaches, and tides that swallow ships whole. Like many regions of the Dark Imperium, Elaria's Vale is cut off from almost all external contact and support. From the Great Rift, there came a new host of arch-enemy forces. These marauding warlords tore into Elaria's Vale, not for destruction and plunder, but with staggering numbers of human and mutant forces seeking to establish their own foul kingdoms on Vale worlds. These were the first encounters with the invading forces known as the Exilarchy and their cruel heretic Astartes overlords, the Pure. Not long after the Rift's manifestation, Law on the creation of Primaris Marines reached Nemeton from elsewhere in the Dark Imperium, carried by a depleted contingent of the Emperor's own custodian guard. Yet like so many other warring chapters in the Imperium's darker half, neither the Emperor's spears nor the Celestial Lions received fully grown battle-ready reinforcements. They were forced to create their own Primaris warriors over time to bolster their ranks. Unpleasant tales are told of reinforcements destined for the Celestial Lions' homeworld of Elysium 9 never reaching the sector due to inquisitorial interference. Though, given the nature of the Cisastrix Maledictum, no one can know the truth of such a matter. In recent years, Ilaria's Vale settled into a seething deadlock between the Adeptus Velari and their foes. A deadlock that held until the Exilarchy struck a decisive blow by laying siege to the Celestial Lion's homeworld. Answering their oldest oath of loyalty, the Emperor's Spears hurled their chapter fleet at the Exilarchy blockade to aid the Celestial Lion's evacuation. Now, with the Emperor's Spears and the surviving Lions gathering their armada to hold their remaining territory, it remains to be seen which way the winds of war will blow in Alara's Vale. The Paragon Cast The Emperor's Spears' first company is known as the Paragons. They are the chapter's warrior elite cast. Paragons wear no crest, their white helms are marked by inverted red tridents painted on their faceplates in barbaric echo of their chapter symbol. Unconfirmed reports claim that to gain acceptance among the Paragons, a supplicant must be recommended by no fewer than three current veterans. He must then perform a number of feats of prowess in battle, as well as secretive blood rites unknown outside the Paragon caste. Paragons are never permitted to serve as officers. They are outside the chain of command. Each one a champion at arms who has foregone the chance to lead his brethren into battle. Witnesses mark strange interplays of authority between the Paragons and traditional Empress Spears officers. The caste is a respected fraternity unto itself, with mission objectives that do not always match those of their brethren. To that end, Paragons are usually focused on elimination of enemy commanders and champions. Many of them wear black banners with their personal heraldry on proud display, though others are just as likely to consider the habit preening and unnecessary. The Pure The first encounter with the heretic Astartes known as the Pure came in a vicious engagement over a Balonian mining outpost in an exosystem asteroid field. Far from the usual classes of formerly Imperial warships that comprise most of the Exilarchy's fleets, the Adeptus Velari found themselves in a pitched battle with their mirror images, traitor Astartes vessels of equivalent bulk, ferocity and firepower to their own. The Celestial Lion's flagship, Blade of the Seventh Sun, was almost lost that day, as was the Bolonian war bark, Alpha Magna Prima. The Pure's origins are a source of debate among the Adeptus Velari and their allies. They bear a symbol worn by no other renegade force, a serpentine basilisk coiled around a captive world, and wear armour of filthy white and corroded bronze. Speculation abounds as to their roots among the traitor legions, or their past identities as a renegade chapter fallen from the Emperor's grace. There are even those among the embattled worlds of Alaria's Vale that claim the basilisks as the pure are often known, are truly the remnants of the once noble star scorpions, vomited back into their former territory and devoted to reclaiming what was once theirs. Soon after their emergence into Imperial space, the pure were known to be recruiting from the star scorpions' former homeworld, 
a dishonor that the Adeptus Velari could not endure. This parasitic harvest was decisively ended by the Empress Spears committing exterminatus on Kamun Sen, leaving a globe of lifeless ash in their wake. The Empress Spears warriors that took part in the burning of Kamun Sen often show the campaign marking on their armor, a black claw marking through a yellow circle. The Iokari Insurrection, early M41. The governor regent of the planet Ukari petitioned the Sentinels of the Vale to aid his loyal armies against a planet-wide rebellion, and it was the Emperor's Spears that answered the call. However, Tristane of the Arakani, war leader of the Fourth, arrived to find the insurrection was already being battled by the Aurora chapter, a technically a cousin bloodline to the Emperor's Spears. Rather than greet the Emperor's Spears as brethren, the commander of the Aurora chapter berated the Emperor's Spears for requiring other warriors to fight their wars inside Elaria's Vale. With typical hot blood, the Emperor's Spears' reply was a planetary deployment right into the heart of the enemy capital, sustaining far heavier losses than the Aurora chapter's meticulously fought counter-offensive, but stealing final victory for themselves through three days and nights of brutal urban warfare. With the arch-enemy warlord's still bloody skull chained to his pauldron, war leader Tristane voxed the Aurora commander and informed him that his men had no right to mark the battle on their war banners as a triumph, since the Emperor's Spears had done all the hard work. The exact events that led to continued destabilization in relations are unclear, though it seems both commanders eventually agreed to an honor duel to end the unrest. Even this engagement is the source of yet more conflict, both chapters claim their champion was the victor, and in the skirmish that followed, both chapters claim that the other side fired the first shot, leading to several warships sustaining significant damage in the name of Adeptus Astartes' pride. Representatives from the Ultramarines, acting either as benevolent overseers or unwanted judges, depending on which chapter's perspective is being described at the time, later ruled in the Aurora chapter's favour. They stated that the Empress Spears had acted on impulsive instinct, rather than following the approved guidelines laid out in the Codex Astartes. Accordingly, they stated that the glory of the Akori victory was to be equally shared. Such was the bitterness of the Ultramarines' perceived inflexibility. Some archives list it as favouritism, that Lord Tristane swore never to set foot on Macrag, even if the planet was imperiled by threat of destruction. This edict was apparently overturned by High King Arukatus the Swordbearer when he assumed the mantle of leadership over the chapter, citing it as an oath of spit and fire made in the heat of the moment. Since then, elements of the Emperor's Spears and the Ultramarines have waged war alongside each other on at least two occasions, though if tales of Imperial observers are to be believed, there remains little affection between the two chapters. No record exists of the Empress Spears and the Aurora chapter fighting together since the events that took place on Ukari. Though there is an apocryphal tale that says a cargo vessel arrives every ten years in the skies above the homeworld of the Aurora chapter, declaring that it brings a tribute to the Empress Spears' beloved cousins. This gift is the same each decade. A ship has a hold full of seawater and several hundred abyssal vine serpents, supposedly a despised and incredibly ugly breed of oceanic vermin on Nemeton, with almost no nutritional value whatsoever and a profoundly unpleasant taste. Battle Cry The chapter's battle cry is a solemn tribal chant, accompanied by the beating of fists on breastplates and weapons crashing against shields. The sound of that hymn is akin to the heartbeat of a primal god. Shuvaka ul Zurun, Shuraka ul Zurun. The warriors of Nemeton chant as they advance into battle. The Gothic translation is a vow or a promise. Redden the earth, redden the earth. Thank you all very much for watching. One of the more new chapters that have been uh, created. This is, of course, based on Aaron Dembski Bowden's novel which uh, the Emperor's Spears, or Spears of the Emperor. I haven't actually read it yet, <laughs> or, or listened to the audio. I forgot the audio. I got it the week after it was released, which is last year. Not, no, 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 20, 2019. Jesus. 
yeah, I've had it since like it was released, basically. I just haven't got around to listening to it. It's on my list, though. Hopefully in the next week or two, I might get round to it. I'm sort of smashing through books at the minute. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, he's really put the work in. And going through this, I can tell that he's put a lot of effort into constructing a mythology behind them and ensuring that the, the world that they're set in is glorious and detailed and rich. And you can really get that from this. Uh, it's pulling in a lot of details from, like, you know, human, uh, current day sort of, or, I guess, historical. St- I don't know. <laughs> it's Aaron Dembski Bowden, man. He knows what he's... Uh, 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 it's Aaron Dembski Bowden. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's pulling something together that looks amazing. So I'm really looking forward to that audio book and learning more about this chapter and learning their stories. But this was a great sort of intro to them, I think, and um, it shows... And it's a nice touch that it's in the Imperium Nihilis, so we get a taste of what's happening in that dark side of the Imperium with Space Marine chapters and so on. And I like the way that they talk about how they came by the Primaris knowledge and all that sort of stuff. It sounds really good. Plus, they seem like arseholes, which I do respect. I do respect a bit of arseholeness um, amongst my Space Marines. It adds flavour, it adds character, and especially when it's against the Ultramarines or anyone associated with them, any of their <laughs> any of their milk blood descendants. You know, it's good stuff. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's going on with this the pure chapter um, and this uh, this Elaria's Veil vale and all that. It looks good. It looks good. It's an interesting setup he's done for them. Uh, there's only one novel out, so I probably will get a few more. But um, yeah, his his Black Legion book is coming soon, so that's the thing to really look forward to. But yeah, this was a this has looked like a good chapter, and um, of course, like in GW, everything that's going on, these are one of the chapters that has been created. Uh, basically, they seem to be a purely Primaris force now. You get me? Um, I, that's what I thought they were, but it seems they were in existence before then. They were one of the last pure old style Astartes foundings, uh, the twenty fifth founding, it seems. And then now they've started creating their own Primaris troops um, as they gained that knowledge, that technology. So, yeah, yeah, it looks good. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks to everybody who's on the channel. You can see your names going by as I um, ramble. But, uh, yeah, this is one of the most brand new pieces of lore that's out there. Uh, so, yeah, definitely uh, definitely want to know and to see how things are going. And, you know, I was a bit worried about how things would go with 40K and there is some issues still. But with stuff like this coming out, I think we're on a good track, and I'm, I'm confident for the future that it's going to be good. Hopefully. We'll see. Anyway, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.